No recording. Okay. So we are doing a study. It's kind of a part two to um, the study we had done the other day in the book of Hebrews. So does anybody remember if we got through chapter six of Hebrews last time or did we not? We finished in uh, chapter five. Okay, cool. So today I would like to take us through chapter six through chapter eight. Okay. So we heard about Melchizedek and how that is the priesthood that Jesus is in. Jesus is the, our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Um, not like what we're going to get into today is the difference between that priesthood and the priesthood of Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, um, and, and why the order of Melchizedek is a better priesthood with better promises. Um, so that's that's where our focus is today. So let's get started. Would anybody like to read Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through, I don't know, 3? No, 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 4. I don't mind. Thank you. We did discuss that. We yeah, did, we did get we did get six. through chapter six. We did. I was just okay. looking. Let's go ahead and start there again, anyway, just for the purposes of context and proper overlap. Okay. Like a refresher. So, okay. would anybody Can like to just, just read chapter six real th real quick, and we can go from there. Can you hear me? No, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on pans, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. For it is possible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. You can continue. We're just going all the way through chapter 6 and then we'll stop and discuss and then move on to chapter 7. If you don't mind. For the earth, no problem. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessings from God. But if it bears th thorns and briars, it is rejected, and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you, yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labour of love which you have shown towards his name, in that you have ministered to the saints, and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit God's infallible purpose in Christ. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, 
and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is possible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which appears, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Thank you. That's a lot. (laughs) Anybody have any questions? Really? No no questions? Everybody perfectly understands Melchizedek and what it's talking about there? Oh, I don't Let's. fully understand. Right, that's my point. So ask away. Tell me what you're thinking, what you're wondering. That's why we're here. I have loads of questions, but it's so much that you'd have to go back to the very beginning and break it down in smaller sections to be able to actually um, pinpoint the questions. That's okay. That's why we're here. So let's, let's start. What is your first question? Or do you want to start breaking it down and then tell me your question? going bit by bit okay let's do that then <clears throat> shall i read the first couple of Actually, verses yes. again yes please because that way when a question pops up for you as you're reading you can ask it okay and for anyone else of course of course of course so let's read going back therefore Leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of price, let us go on to perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptism, of laying on hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal adjustment. And this we will do if God permits. So I'm taking it that that first section is saying what they're not going to do. Okay. But it's a bit... Correct. What they're saying is, okay, everything we've said in Hebrews 1 through 5 was about the very basic foundations of our faith. But let's move on from that now and talk about the more excellent meat of the word so like okay we've talked about the milk of the word now now let's move on to the meat of the word that's basically what that opening is talking about from verses one through three yeah king james says therefore having the principles of the doctrine of christ or leaving the the principles i'm not sure what translation you you're doing but i think the king james uh illustrates that 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 concept better. Okay, I'm reading from the New King James. I was going to say it's very very similar speech. I actually liked it. Um, you- it does make it just a little bit easier to understand for most people, while still being overall faithful to the text. Um, so I'm okay with it. I'm not one of these people who's going to yell at somebody if they read a different translation of scripture than I do. You know. At least they're re- reading the word. Praise God, you know. <laughs> so, 
So are you, do you have questions about that, anybody? Or do we want to move on to the next set of verses? So he's, he's basically saying uh, with the perf uh, moving on to the perfection, that, that's, that's the meat. That's where we're perfected in Christ. Correct. In the, meat, the, in the meat of the scripture. Yeah. He's moving on to the more complicated matters, the weightier matters. So, yes. Um, I'll pick up in verse four or rather verse three. And this will we do if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance seeing they execute again to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Does anybody have questions about that? Uh, we had questions about that. There were a lot of questions about that the other night when we were going through this about what type of people is that talking about falling away, mm -hmm. right? Right. It's, it's not talking about people struggling with, with sin making a mistake and being very sorry for it and asking God's forgiveness. That is not what it's talking about. Honestly, just using Leslie ease here. Okay. This is not doctrine. It's my opinion. Um, I think it's talking about people who are absolutely apostate. So let's, let's look at the Greek word used here. I've got both the digital and physical copies open in front of me so I can do this. It's a uh, parapipto is the Greek. It means to fall beside a person or thing, to slip aside, to deviate from the right path, to turn aside, which indicates a, a conscious action, a deliberate action. That's my words, not the translators. Continuing with the translators, to turn aside and wander, to error, to fall, to fall away from the true faith, from the worship of Yehovah. Okay, to fall aside, to where, darn it, this, this lag I have when I scroll with my mouse drives me nuts. I'm sorry. It causes me to lose my place all the time. Yes, yes. See, let me share my screen. This note, I would like you guys to see it. So you know, this is not my opinion. This is what the translators are straight up. Okay. Do you see my screen? Yes. All right, look at that that I just highlighted. To apostatize, that kind of falling away. To become apostate to the faith. To do something that is so far outside of the faith that there's no coming back from it. So this is not talking here about making a mistake and regretting it and Lord, please forgive me. We all struggle with that, okay? This is talking about I would include under this, just this is just me talking now. I would include under this the Greasy Grace message. I would include this, oh, there are many ways to, to God nonsense that we're hearing from people all around the so-called religious leaders from around the world today. That's apostasy. Because it. how do we know it's apostasy? How do we know? Because it directly contradicts the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Broad, and another place, broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go thereby. But straight is the gate, meaning tight. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. I may have gotten those reversed. That was just off the top of my head. But I think you all know what I'm talking about. So it, it's apostasy to say there are many paths to God. Well, not if you're listening to God. Not if you're believing him. Unless, of course, the people saying this are not worshiping the God that we worship. Maybe their God tells them something different, but our God, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, the father of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself in the flesh, 
God in the flesh told us, "Uh uh-uh, there's one way. And anyone who tries to get in another way is a thief and a robber. That that's what Paul's well, people assume Paul wrote Hebrews. Nobody knows that for sure. Uh just being honest with you, okay? Nobody knows. But that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about here. It's talking about deliberately going so far outside of the lines of the faith as to be apostate. So those people, the scriptures say, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, so they were saved. They heard the gospel and accepted it and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of Yeho- of God. Sorry, I'm translating from the Hebrew here, not transliterated Hebrew. I'm, I'm reading out of my, my Bible and it has the actual written name of God here instead of just the term God. So I'm translating. I apologize for stumbling. Um, have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again. So it's impossible to renew them again. If they apostatize. Impossible to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they execute again to themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So they're going around. I'm sorry, but there's somebody who's coming to my mind as I say this. And I'm just going to use it as an example because I think it's a really clear one. Kenneth Copeland. I'm sorry, but the stuff that guy's saying, the stuff that guy's doing, by no means am I the judge of righteousness and unrighteousness. Thank God I wouldn't want the responsibility, frankly. But just looking at it, that guy's so apostate, I worry for him. Just being real with you, I worry for the guy. I hope he has not crossed that line. I really mean that. I hope he hasn't. I hope he's not done that. I hope that the Holy Spirit is able to move in his life and bring him to repentance before he's lost forever. But that's the guy coming to my mind as I read this. And it's not that Jesus Christ gets crucified again every time somebody becomes apostate. That's not what it's saying here. It's saying they are shaming the sacrifice that Jesus made. They're basically spitting on it by becoming apostate, by going so far outside of what God dictated, of what God said, no, this is the way. They're spitting on his sacrifice by doing that. That's a dangerous thing. It reminds me when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees and he said to them, you know, how shall you escape the fires of hell? Notice he asked a question. He didn't make a statement because he is wise and he knows that when God speaks, things happen. So he did not speak that fate over them. He asked a question instead. How can you escape the fires of hell? Well, praise God. The mercy of God is so great. Obviously, he said this before his crucifixion. I would say that his crucifixion is how they could escape the fires of hell if they turned from unbelief towards belief. If they repented, right? So I'm going to continue in verse 7. For the earth which drinks in the rain that comes oft upon it and brings forth herbs good for them by whom it is dressed or farmed receives blessing from God. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. So there's a distinction being made here by the writer of Hebrews. Somebody who pulls up the weeds in their own garden, tends to the good fruit, produces good fruit. The Holy Spirit reigns on that person. And they bring forth herbs good for them by whom it is dressed. They're producing fruit. They're doing the right thing. And they receive blessing from God. But the other guys 
who are apostate are being compared to thorns and briars. And it says they are rejected and nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. They're producing bad fruit, thorns and briars. To get a clearer understanding, we can look at Genesis chapter 3, the fall of Adam and Eve, when God spoke to Adam and told him what the consequences of his sin would be. Notice that one of the things that God said was the earth would no longer bring forth abundance for Adam, but would produce thorns and briars. And by the sweat of his brow shall he eat his bread all his life. Wouldn't be easy anymore. Because it's the fruit of sin, the bad fruit. The, writers, the writer of Hebrews is, is, is uh, tapping that reference as an example that their audience would have understood. Are there any questions so far? No, I just realized you took an example of Copeland there. Greater combination is on those of the teachers. Yes. I mean, I fear for the guy. I really do. I, I don't wish any evil on anyone. I fear for it. I hope to God that he repents in time to be saved. I really do. And he's by no means the only one, unfortunately. Okay. You guys have no questions. You're, you have no thoughts, nothing. There, listen to me. I'm going to say it again because there are some new people here who have never yet heard me say this. There is no such thing as a stupid question. My mother wrote, raised me. I almost said Rose. Ah, struggling today. Have grace for me, please. My, my mother raised me with the saying, the only stupid question is the one that you don't ask. Uh, so listen to me, please. When you guys share your thoughts, when you share your comments, when you share any questions that you might have, not one person here is ever going to condemn you for it. I can promise you that. James and I would never allow it if somebody did. Um, but also, you have no idea how, how many times people have asked questions or shared a thought that they were having and it's actually helped me, it's helped James, it's helped many people to understand something that we maybe had completely missed. So who knows but that your question or your insight might open up an entirely new level of understanding that I have missed or that somebody else may have missed or maybe somebody else is struggling with. So it helps us all when you share your thoughts, when you share your questions and comments. So I, I hope I'm encouraging you to share and participate. This this group has never been about one person standing on a, an elevated platform and talking down to everyone else in attendance. It's never been designed that way. Um, and there are several people here right now, I think, who would be willing to attest to that, that we try very hard here to have a place that it feels safe for everyone to be able to share their ideas and their questions, maybe in a way they'd never had available to them before. We're, that's exactly what we're working towards here because we believe that iron sharpens iron, as the scriptures say. We believe that every one of us, I, I'll, I'll speak just for myself, even though I know I could safely say these things on behalf of James, but I will limit it to myself right now. I, I believe with all my heart, every single one of you have been created in the image and likeness of Almighty God. And to every single one of you, because he is rich in mercy and giving, that he has given gifts to every single one of you. And all of us will have individual things that we can bring to the table that nobody else has. Maybe a particular insight or maybe a particular question or thought that the rest of us missed. So please, please be, I, I pray, I really mean that. I pray that I am encouraging you to share, to feel like you can, because it, it excites us and blesses us so much. It really does when you do. So can please, I ask a question? yes, please. I was waiting for a pause break, but uh, you kept going. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I was ministered yesterday about how I, uh, how you can't lose your, uh, 
can't lose your salvation when you have faith in Jesus. Um, tell me how these people, how apostates lost salvation. I think they stopped believing. I think that's what qualifies them as apostate. They start believing something else. They're no longer believing the foundation of the faith as it was laid. Like Paul said, no man can lay any other foundation than that which was laid, Jesus Christ. So when you start going outside of that, doesn't that mean you're no longer believing that foundation? You're believing something else, another gospel. Like Paul wrote that in Galatians, I fear for you, lest ye receive another gospel and ye bear with them. You might bear with them. I, I fear for you. That's what he was talking about. Anybody is else? It, is it possible to receive another Jesus? Oh no, unfortunately it's not impossible. It's not the real Jesus. That could lead on a really long rabbit trail, believe me. Um, there's some very startling stuff out there. But let me just put it this way. There's a Gnostic Jesus. There's what I call buddy Christ, where, hey, God's cool. He doesn't care what I do. We're best buds, no matter what. Uh-huh. Yes, he does care. He cared enough to die for it. Right? Do you care enough to die for your sin? And I'm not directing that at you, Stephanie. I'm just, you know, to whomever would say that. But these are not the authentic Jesus of Nazareth born of a virgin named Miriam or Mary in Bethlehem, Judea, walked the shores of the Galilee, teaching and preaching, died on the cross for our sins, rose from the dead three days later on first fruits, and now sits glorified at the right hand of the Father in heaven. It's not that Jesus. It's another Jesus and therefore another gospel. It exists. They're counterfeits. It's what the enemy always does. He always tries to imitate the work of God where it's just a little different. Because the most believable lie is the one that has a seed of truth in it. That's, that's why people believe it. And that's why so many people who are not reading the word for themselves and are not in discipleship can get so confused they can get so far off track and never even realize the danger that they're in because they haven't searched the word for themselves Bible verse yes second corinthians 13 5 examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not realize that christ jesus is in you unless of course you failed the test this is new international version. It's the first one on Bubble Hub. Okay, let me <laughs> let me look that up. What was the address on that scripture again, please? Second Corinthians chapter thirteen, verse five. Second Corinthians thirteen. Whoops. If I can spell, ah, Corinthians thirteen. Okay, and I'll scroll down to verse five. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. Let's look at that word. Let's look at that word in Greek. It apparently has two words associated. That makes sense. Greek does that a lot, actually, because it's a complex language. Tis. Okay. Certain. Okay. Any man. All right, a certain one, certain while, all right? So it's an in, enclitic indefinite pronoun. In other words, it can be used in a variety of ways. Okay, let's look at the next one. Greek 96, Strong's Greek 96. Adokimos, adokimos. Not standing the test, not approved. Well, what does the scripture tell us? It tells us study to show yourselves approved. Cast away, rejected, probably used of metals and coins. Okay, so this is like a purification process, a refining process. They would 
liquefy the metal many times over and every time they did a little few a little less of the impurity would bubble to the top and so they would scrape that off it was called the dross they would scrape it off the top and then refine it again until they could see their own reflection in it it was so pure that's called sanctification in the spiritual sense so that which does not prove itself as it ought is unfit, unproved, spurious, reprobate. Again, like apostasy. The conscience being seared, right? But people, we were talking about this earlier, weren't we, Stephanie? How the fact, the very fact that certain people worry about whether or not they're in right standing with God is a pretty good indication that God's still working on you, right? You're not reprobate because your conscience isn't seared. You can know that, so you're passing the test. You can know that because you're so moved with worry about whether or not a person, that person is in right standing with God. That's how you know that the Lord's still working on you. And if the Lord's still working on you, then you haven't been rejected. Right? Make sense? Yes. Cool. Do we have any other questions? You guys want to continue? Okay. Um, some people um, like myself, uh, I have uh, gone from believing into Jesus into something else and to back to Jesus. How is that different than being a reprobate? Okay, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite clear in what you're asking me. I think she's asking if I b become a believer and then I get mixed up and say nor, right? Okay, then, yeah, yeah. And then, I've, then I, I'm enlightened again, not to use a new age term. but Right. I, I realize what I'm into, and I I, I leave it, and I, I, I draw back to the faith. Yeah, see, that's called repentance. That's called repentance. It, this is, again, once again, this is why it is so important to study, to show yourselves the proof. You don't just take the word of somebody else for it. You must be studying the word for yourself. It's the only way that you will have enough understanding of the ways of God to be able to tell the difference when something a person is teaching is off. It's, it's only by studying the word that you can get to a place where you go, um, wait a minute, something's not quite right here. What is it? And then the scriptures start coming to your mind. You're like, yeah, but what this guy's saying, that's not what the Bible actually says. You know, but people who are not doing that and they're just raised inside of a religious system all of their lives, they don't have anything that they ha can rely on to test what they're hearing, whether or not it's true. This is how they can be led into gross error. So study to show yourselves approved. Leslie? Yes. So today someone told me that um i am looking into things too much and he told me that it's being unloving to look into things so much that's ridiculous and that's absolutely absurd yeah he looked at me and said i don't see the love of christ in you and his solution was stop looking into things so that i can stop finding errors right <laughs> See, that's called circular logic. Oh, well, you're, you're finding errors, so don't look at the truth anymore, and then you won't see error anymore. That's not the problem. That's not the solution. The problem is the error. The solution to the error is, no, you don't change the word of God to fit what you want. You change what you want to fit the word of God. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. I didn't get that 100% right, but again, I'm working off the top of my head here, so have some grace for me, please. 
That's the answer. So that's the problem with today's world. Conformity. Conformity is a real big problem. Because groupthink doesn't work. It's how the nation of Israel, God's people, ended up getting so far into error that God ended up having to destroy his own temple because of the stuff that was going on inside of it. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve two masters. You will either love the one and hate the other, or you'll cling to the one and leave the other. That's what Jesus said. So you cannot eat from the table of God and the table of demons. And I'm sorry, but conformity and compromise are exactly what's wrong with the world today. Truth is truth, period. The word of God is truth. If some religious system, whatever label it bears, I don't care. If it's not lining up with the word of God and is condemning somebody who's saying, yeah, but that's not what the word says. Oh, well, I don't see the love of Christ in you. Then I have to question which Christ they're following because the new age is full of Christ. Did you know that? They follow someone they call a Christ too. Luciferians believe in a coming Christ too. And most assuredly, it's not Jesus of Nazareth that they're talking about. In fact, they write quite openly about how much they hate him. They won't even speak his name. They hate him. So many different. See, when God wrote in the Old Testament, you thought I was altogether one such as yourself. And goes on to tell them how wrong that they were to believe that. See, we, ha we cannot, first of all, it's impossible for us to take God and change him into our image. But the very attempt at it is actually idolatry. It's idolatry of the worst kind because really what we're bowing to is the altar of self. And is that not the core of the Luciferian lie? Ye shall be as gods. I'd say that's pretty apostate. But that doesn't mean that whoever said that to you is, is apostate, okay? Because as I've said to you before, a lot of people say things like that because they don't know anything else. There are certain religious institutions that have worked for centuries very, very calculatingly to create tiny little boxes to put people's minds in. And they twist and cherry pick scripture to try to put on a veneer of holiness that is not true. Just like the Pharisees, and I am not anti-Jew, okay? You guys know that. You know that. But it's, it is what it is. Jesus told the Pharisees, ye are whitewashed tombs. You, you have a veneer of godliness on the outside, but on the inside, you're filled with dead men's bones. This is what he's talking about. These systems of control that think it's okay to take one scripture completely out of context of the rest of the passage or book and try to twist it into their to fit their own agendas. And then the people sitting in those pews, not searching the word for themselves because they've been lied to by whoever's standing at the pulpit, talking down to them, saying, you don't understand anything. I know everything. You don't know how to interpret the word of God. You, you have to have me interpret it for you. Therefore, sit down, shut up and listen and do everything that I say. Don't you dare look in the word of God for yourself. But there's a reason for that. There's a reason they have rules in their institution that say that it's dangerous to read the word of God for themselves. You have to go to your priest. Yeah, I've been it's, told that a lot. Yeah, I know. I know. So you're definitely right. It's a system of control because why do they fear you looking in the word of God? 
at the top, okay? I'm not talking about the low-level people, like a, a, an average priest. He was taught these th this way too, okay? He likely doesn't know any better either. He only knows what he's been taught. Most people filling the Catholic Church only know what's been talked at them all of their lives. Some of them over the course of multiple generations. So I'm not condemning them. But the ones at the top know exactly what they're doing. And they are terrified for you to find out the truth for yourself. They are. It is why they oppose the publication of the King James Bible so violently that they were willing to burn alive millions of people for having even one, one scripture verse in their possession. Because when they're no longer the gatekeepers and the source of all knowledge of the word of God, then they can't control you. So they don't want you reading the word of God for yourself and understanding it for yourself because then they can't lie to you successfully anymore and they cannot control you. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's what Jesus said. See, these are the same exact problems that the people of God were dealing with when Jesus was walking the shores of the Galilee. Identical problems. It never ceases to amaze me how much what we're looking at here at the end of the age parallels so closely the experience of the early church. It's just like you could, it's a copy paste job. About the only thing that's different are our clothes and our language. Everything else is the same. And this is what Jesus was railing against. The systems of control made by men to control men while trying to use the word of God as an excuse to give a, a veneer of authority to do it. This is why Jesus was not liked by the Pharisee. Because telling the people the truth for free out in the open where the where they couldn't control it threatened their power base because once the people knew the truth they didn't have to go through a man anymore to reach god jesus bridged that gap for us he is our high priest now that enables us entitles us to go boldly before the throne of grace you are qualified to read the word of God for yourself. You are qualified to understand it. How can I say that with such absolute confidence? Because you believe on him and you have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says, Jesus Christ himself said, the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. So you are qualified. You are smart enough. And God bless every single one of you for this craving to know God that you have. We're done ranting now. I hope that was somehow helpful to you. I so, propose. I'm sorry. Go ahead, James. I was going to say, is that enough review on the chapter six before we get yes. into seven? Yes. I was going to propose that we take a break. And then we can come back with a new recording, fresh recording, just to keep it digestible for listeners, that goes into Chapter 7. Does that sound okay to everybody? Fine by me. Okay. Do that. Um, I have a question. Oh, yes. I have a yes. question. It's nice. What? 